Sometimes it seems like all the problems in the world are unfixable. Trying to change them is ludicrous. Poverty, hatred, violence, starvation, and illiteracy are always going to exist. Those are just the facts of life. Or are they? You have to stop and think. Why are some people badly off while others thrive? It's not always fair, but there are reasons. And if we look at the conditions in which people all over the world are thriving, we can use these conditions as a foundation for a better world. The public schools here don't teach second languages efficiently. Look at most of Europe. A second language is often taught at elementary school level, and sometimes before the child even enters school. So instead of complaining about it, politicians and public schools here should work to follow Europe's example. And what about public education in general? We're always hearing about how terrible our school system is here, barring college. Well, where does education thrive? Let's take a look at Japan, for example, where students have to pass entrance exams to get into their next level of public school. And there is a half day of cram school on Saturdays. It doesn't sound too fun, right? <laughs> but the attitude in Japan is different. Children are generally raised to invest more importance in their schoolwork, and they usually take it more seriously. Now, instead of trying to throw money at our public education problem, think about that. Japan's schools score higher because of the societal attitude, not because of extra money. In fact, we spend more money on education than Japan does, so where are we going wrong? Well, most Japanese are shocked by the number of administrators in our public school system. <laughs> Hiring extra workers to do very specific tasks that a single person could do is costing us money and not helping our school system. So what we need is a change in attitude, not more money. Not an easy task, and Japan does admire the freedom for creativity in our school system. But if our children are taught at a young age to work harder and apply themselves fully to anything they do, including school, I believe we'll have a more successful generation on the rise. But enough about school, and on to other more pressing issues. What about nutrition? Why is so much of America obese? The availability of fattening junk food that is usually much cheaper than the healthy counterpart. In some cases, subsidies of junky foods are to blame, and overall, a general attitude that diseases are to be combated with pills, not with healthy eating and exercise. Why do some hospitals have a McDonald's in the cafeteria? <laughs> Why do you see an ad for diabetes medication right after one for Pop-Tarts on TV? Let's think about healthier places in the world, and especially those little segments of the world where everyone lives to be 100 years old and often older. They're called centenarians. One of these is in Costa Rica. There's a little village there where 100-year-old women get up at 4 a.m. daily to milk the cows and do vigorous cleaning and farm work. Their sons and daughters are still very active and lively and riding bicycles everywhere at like age 80. What's their secret? An undiscovered medicine? The fountain of youth? No. They eat food from the ground that hasn't been processed or tampered with, and they exercise a lot. Corn and beans are staples of their diets, and they don't come from fatty corn chips or jumbo-sized burritos. <laughs> it's that simple. Why don't we follow their example? Medicine is easier, perhaps. Once again, it's an attitude that has to change. On the same vein of nutrition, let's look at obesity's opposites. Anorexia, bulimia, and other eating disorders that involve starving or purging in order to lose weight, and often an unhealthy amount of weight. The percentage of these people in the US is low, but the amount is considerable enough to garner suspicion. Why is it a problem here? Why would anyone willingly starve when they could have everything? Well, that's just the thing. Insecurity and possible past trauma mixed with over-availability of fattening foods could lead to a person crying out for control. They know they can't control what others do to them, but they can control themselves. 
And controlling their eating habits gives them a confidence boost because it's a hard thing to do when so much tasty, fattening food is sitting right in front of you. This confidence boost is usually temporary and leaves a person with an eating disorder down the road of addiction to the feeling of losing weight and restricting food intake or exercising. The addiction means they won't be happy at a healthy lower weight. They will probably want to keep going and some continue until they die. So how do we go about fixing this problem? Well, let's look at usual treatment programs for eating disorders. You have a disease and we're going to make you get rid of it, is the general attitude of these programs. We're looking at someone's mental state of mind as a disease, whether it is or not, technically, is not going to help a person feel better about themselves or gain confidence from sources besides starvation. Instead, it will probably leave them feeling worthless and messed up. How should these people be treated instead? The treatment should focus on their strengths and developing them further, not on their weaknesses and how terrible they are. Someone who willingly starves themselves or purges up all food or exercises all day does have a lot of willpower. They are just using it for the wrong goal and the wrong reasons. The willpower could be focused on health instead of starvation. It could stem from a longing to be strong instead of a longing to be bone thin or over controlled portions. A treatment plan that focused on the positives of each person would more likely empower them to want health, to strive for health on their own, without being pushed, than a plan that focuses on all the wrongs. If someone is forced to eat and gains weight in treatment, but is still addicted to the weight loss and strict control, they're probably going to lose all the weight back and more once they're free from the treatment. So why do many treatment centers centers for eating disorders in the U.S. simply focus on the negative. Because we believe in fixing diseases with magic pills instead of improving our overall health. Calling anorexia or bulimia a simple disease and trying to fix it with food alone, the magic pill, is the same as treating heart disease with medicine while still eating the same junky foods that have caused it. There are no magic pills. Following positive examples and changing our attitudes over time are what's needed. Fixing what's wrong by looking at what's right. And for everyone to adopt a more positive attitude on whatever, we need to improve ourselves first. Looking at what's right to fix what's wrong. The first time I heard the idea for the service, I was contemplative to say the least. I mean, how often do I look at other things to fix my own errors? But thinking about my life, I realized that's often what I do. We all want to be the best people we can. We all want to improve certain parts of our personalities or our bodies, our outlook on life, or even the way we treat others. I, for one, would like to be more steadfast in my convictions towards exercising. We often turn towards other people to correct ourselves. Two years ago, when I stumbled into my European history class in high school for the first time and cracked open the old history book in deep need of replacing, thanks to South Carolina's public education, <laughs> I found myself on a page entitled Renaissance and Enlightenment Philosophers. These periods gave birth to several important brands of philosophy, from humanism, a study that focuses on human values and concerns, to Hermeticism, a set of philosophical and religious beliefs based tightly on Hellenistic Egyptian writings. Famous philosophers such as Montaigne, Montesquieu, and Erasmus gained fame during the era of Enlightenment and Renaissance works. Montaigne, known as a brilliant French author, wrote of the middle road, an alternative to extremist beliefs that tells us to approach situations with an unbiased and logical, unwavering eye. When I read about Montaigne's teachings, I saw a reflection of myself in the extremist practices. I often entered discussions with my mind already set and fought with vigor and blind determination to win. I saw the intelligence of the middle path, and since then, I've been changing my own perspectives to be a better person and a better debater. The philosophers and philosophes, the giants upon whose shoulders we have built ourselves, 
are absolutely a great example of what we can look to in order to better ourselves. But even closer to home, let's talk about theology. Whether you are a Buddhist or a Christian, Islamic or Jewish, non-denominational in all regards, atheist, agnostic, or even another religion I haven't mentioned, we all have people to look up to. In the Buddhist faith, there is Siddhartha Gautama, more commonly referred to as Buddha. Reading the teachings of the Enlightened One gives you insight to end suffering, achieve nirvana, and escape the cycle of suffering and rebirth. Those of the Christian or Catholic faith commonly gain their morals and ethics from the Bible and the collected works of Jesus Christ. Those of the Islamic religion read of Muhammad, the founder of the religion and their teacher in wisdom and faith. And Judaism follows Moses and the teachings of the Old Testament. Of course, Unitarian Universalist churches typically agree with and learn from the seven principles and purposes. And even those without a true leader of their theology still tend to follow certain ideals or practices which embody the spirit of what teachings their church wishes to convey. Now, making ourselves better people doesn't mean we're incorrect or wrong to begin with. In fact, oftentimes we find ourselves just trying to become better to suit ourselves. From reading a self-help book to reading the collected works of Krishnamurti, we all try to improve ourselves and correct those certain parts of our personalities that we and others do not enjoy. Alcoholics involved in AA have sponsors who have either been in their situation in the past or have helped others in their situation before partnering with these people at these meetings. They are mentors to those who need help. Having been in these situations before, they often are able to offer wisdom and are truly people to look up to. And in fact, our own childhood often yields a person to look up to for ourselves, whether it be a superman or superwoman, a parent, a guardian, a friend, or any other family member. These idols give us ethical and moral support while helping us to shape our personalities and guiding us to becoming who we are. We often look at texts, teachings, friends, or family to see what's right and fix what's wrong. At this time, I'd like to open the floor for conversation. Uh, we have time for a few questions and comments.